Oh, you're watching closely for this one. I think this is brilliant. You can just about see a lure, surface lure coming in. Bam, you see it? Show you that again. So basically, I've got a surface lure here, retrieving in, retrieving in, just as I've literally got it to my feet. Bass comes in right to left, smashes that lure. Oh, it's lure fishing at its finest, this from a few years ago, but it, it does show how close bass do come to the shore. Um, we'll look at another example in a minute of a nine pound bass, but it's worth remembering there are different reasons that a bass will be close to shore. Um, you could be in deeper water off jetties and piers close to rocks, um, but also shingle as well, because when the waves recede back, uh, using this as an example here, the waves will come up on the shingle and that can disorientate the bait fish and bass very often push white bait and mackerel close into the shore um, so it really is a hot spot right near your feet if a bass hits these right it's time to watch now <laughs> this happens really quickly So this is it, nine pound bass has just smashed that mackerel right in front of my feet. I saw it, you can see it there. There's actually some other stuff going on behind as well with other bass and mackerel, but that was our fish. So not much of a fight because it literally brought itself up on the beach. <laughs> Beautiful. And then just looking back at that little segment there, you can see that there's bass and mackerel. Um, I think the one on the right there is a bass, there's mackerel, and then obviously we've got our fish bottom right hand corner there. I would say it's about a metre away from my feet. So I'm sorry if that footage wasn't, wasn't the best fight. <laughs> Uh, it gave it a hell of a pull, but it was literally so close to the beach, it almost beached itself. I think what those videos show is it, um, bass do come in really close, and they are taking advantage of that wave movement as it hits the shingle as well. So don't be afraid to reel right into your feet, as we've just seen. Um, a lot depends on the ground you're fishing over. We're getting into answering different questions now, but... I mean, even on, on estuaries, you might want to take advantage of metals and casting further to get the lure into the, the channels and things like that. Um, but if you're just starting off, really just cast close to shore in good conditions. We're here at a big one with Henry Gilby. Henry's very kindly going to show us through some of the Savage Gear creature baits, and I know a lot of you have been talking about creature baits. Well, thank you for talking to me, it's cool. No, it's okay, we've just been chatting for a while. Creature baits, you know, people from the freshwater world, they know all about this, I don't. I don't come from freshwater lure fishing, so I know very little about this, but I've just got this sort of growing suspicion, and I'm, you know, talking to bass anglers far better than me. I just, you think about bass fishing, think about estuaries, think about crabs, peeler crabs, how many times do you think those bass have got their heads down feeding on crab? You know, I, like I was saying to you, Matt, earlier, I, I don't take fish because I don't eat fish. Um, but I know people take the odd bass to eat, always tell me they're stuffed full of crab. You know, we, we know bass eat crab. We spend our lives kind of imitating sand eels, you know, blennies, prawns, etc. How much do we try and imitate a crab? And I think these creature baits, I think that's what it is. Um, you know, my, my mate at home, he calls them happy lobsters. Um, <laughs> I'm speak to me in a year, and if I failed, I've spent too much money trying it, and I've failed. But I just think, I think it's, oh, I know it's gonna work, because I've got mates who've done it already, and it has worked. But I just think sometimes, when they're head down, I think this might open up. First, you know, I can think of loads of places I fish that I might avoid certain parts of the mark. Now, I'll target that specific part. I'm trying to imitate a crab. And it's interesting, isn't it? We're used to casting and retrieving, but these would yeah. be more, it's more a case of dropping it in 
and doing very little, yeah, like yes. like a, a small lobster, a squat lobster. You have to hop a paddle tail around. I was kind of hopping them around, and then I had a heart attack and got in the way, and I had to sort of mess my fishing up. But now, and again, talking to Mark Cowling, Danny Parkins, you know, proper, proper bass anglers, and then, you know, when you walk in an estuary, you know, what, what's a crab doing? A crab isn't doing, it's not hopping around, a crab's scuttling around. So I think sl- just straight retrieve. You know, we're almost in bass fishing, aren't we? It's almost some of us, some people feel guilty if they're just straight retrieving. I love straight retrieving because it's easy. I don't want to twitch my freaking lures all the time. You know, make fishing easy, isn't it? So I think um, slowly along the bottom, stop, move. You know, how does a crab, I'm trying to imitate a crab, maybe a happy lobster, um, yeah, squat yeah. lobster. Um, how does a crab move? You know, I know when I'm walking, you see that crab move. That is what I've got. When I'm fishing with it now, when I'm going to start fishing with it, that's what I've got in my head. That sort of visual, a visual side of the crab. Brilliant, Henry, Henry. Thank you. That is excellent. So we've got lots of brands here. Most of them are under the Predator Tackle banner. Yes, that's the same rod. Westing behind us specifically today, we are looking for. Uh, those creature baits, uh, things we can utilise as bass anglers from fresh water. Basically on the lookout for those lures that aren't the shad types, um, aren't hard lures, jointed lures. Forget about that for this episode. Looking for those creature baits. So I hope you join me and we'll have a little look. Um, on, our, on our quest to find creature baits, I have found Dan Brackley. Um, he is a renowned lure angler. He comes with a very good reputation. Uh, he's here at the Rapala. Uh, unit here and we're going to talk about creature baits no prawns today unfortunately not <laughs> there is a prawn in the range unfortunately it's not coming to the UK as yet but keep your eyes peeled because we definitely think it's going to be a game changer today we're going to be talking about our new release from Rapala which is a soft plastic this one's called the cleanup crawl it's been designed by an American bass angler and a few other renowned anglers around the world. I'm super excited about this. It's a little different to your normal creature bait, which are all buoyant. Little features like the legs are facing the wrong way. So this is gonna give you vibration through the water. As you can see, the arms are really flexible, but on the end of them, it's quite a big. So this gives you a paddle movement. I'll show you in the water and I'll let you guys make your own mind up and decide if it's worth putting into your fishing. So as you'll notice we've got it set up on a weedless rig. Now you're not limited to this, you can rig it up any way. So you'll notice that it slowly settles down and a lot of us at Rapala have been criticizing this, especially in the UK. I however think this is a great feature to the lure and I'll let you guys decide for yourself. But when you think about a creature stroke shrimp prawn whatever lobsters they it's only when they being attacked they become aggressive nine times out of ten they'll be on the bottom so that by the time you move this and the legs are sat up that's when it's been aggressive if you're moving it then the fish is thinking it's 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 under threat and I think this is going to stimulate bites for it the great thing is is you don't need a lot of movement to get this to move as you can see, the whole time those legs are moving, that they become aggressive. Nine times out of ten, they'll be on the bottom. So that by the time you move this and the legs are sat up, that's when it's been aggressive. If you're moving it, then the fish is thinking it's, it's, it's under threat. And I think this is going to stimulate bites for it. The great thing is, is you don't need a lot of movement to get this to move. As you can see, the whole time those legs are moving, the claws are moving and you can use it as well on a straight retrieve because it will just flutter in, flutter out and as you can see it's great moving. But I definitely think the key to this is going to be jigging it along the bottom with really sharp harsh movements. As you can see the pause and I think this is going to be crucial is that pause is letting it rest and then that sharp jerk and then it kicks up like it's aggressive and it doesn't want to be eaten. I'll let you guys make your mind up. And Dan, and so obviously in sea fishing we're full of snags. Yep. Um, I noticed that you're using the hook in a like a weedless way there. Yep. What what about the action? Um, are we a little bit limited to how we can retrieve that? You know, we're going to go into the nearest snag, or is it buoyant enough? Is it angle angle come into it? 
I think if you're fishing in a weedless situation and you have to choose your, your weights correctly. Obviously this, is, this one's particularly designed for freshwater fishing in amongst rocks and bits and pieces so it's t designed to kind of bounce in and out of them obviously you'll pull through weed um, and other bits and pieces like that kelp i should imagine this you should have no problem pulling through that if you're fishing in amongst that um, uh, if it's more sandy bottoms that you're fishing with i'd definitely use an exposed jig head because i think that's going to give up your hookup ratio a lot better than it will like with this but by using it weedless, you're giving yourself at least a bit of chance fishing in amongst those snags of getting your lure back nine times out of ten. Yeah, that's great. I mean, to me, that looks like a maybe a squat lobster. Uh, you could even pass as a prawn, that, couldn't it? Most certainly you can. I mean, the great thing is about creature baits is they can pass as anything. Because it being a crustacean of some sort, some way, shape or form, you're always going to find something in any sea situation that will replicate that kind of... What other colours do you do? So, uh, as far as I know, there's going to be about five or six different colours, um, ranging from whites, oranges, greens, uh, motor oils. Um, for us in the freshwater, a white one, it particularly in this size, is going to be a key color because most crayfish, when they're born, actually are come out white. I don't know if that's relevant in a sea kind of scenario, but as a lot of you guys know, a black is a most probably the most fantastic color you can use. Most underrated, but most probably one of the best. Um, have a look at the range when it comes out because I definitely think there's going to be something there that might suit you guys. Um, even if it's just one pack just to trial, uh, this is definitely going to be a go-to in my box this year. Brilliant. Dan, thanks ever so much. Um, yeah, it's one of the questions a lot of you are asking and I think Dan has answered that really fully today. Nice one. Hella crawl one. What's that one there? Um, notice Dan saying about black being a colour, that could be a good start. Uh, these could pass, actually, these molting TRD ones, they could pass as a uh, ragworm, couldn't they? Oh, those as well, God. We we'll spend a fortune here. What's that one called? The one I'm using? Freaky Flex. Yeah. So that could pass as a small lobster, couldn't it? For us sea anglers, you know, rather than a crayfish, we get like lobsters. Very, very, very similar. Yeah. What's he been buying now? <laughs> Still on the theme of creature baits, this is Mark Fairhurst from Manic Fishing. Uh, what have you got, mate? Well, I just... So I've just put them under a UV light. I mean, obviously you can't see that. But, but yeah, I like the look of these. I bought some uh, from Mr Fish in Jersey, and they were about 25 quid, I think, for two. And these are five of them for six quid. And I don't really think the fish are going to know the difference, to be honest with you. Let's have um, a closer look, yeah. Yeah, especially How the would how are you hooking those, Mark? Uh, well, I would go uh, like a, a small lead head through there, um, probably, or just go a normal hook and then put a ball, a ball head on there, or maybe fish it with a boom and a and a trace. But I think the ras will smash that. So you, you I mean, you, yeah, you say so you're specifically looking at ras. Yeah. What about? Um, how would you move them because obviously we're not going to be using those like a normal lure no uh, i think probably a similar sort of way like a little vertical jig just a wrist snapping affair with it i think that would be uh because because rats they get agitated um you know they're i don't know if they're, they're they're quite predatory and i think that they get agitated if you bang in a weight down or you're banging a lure down in front of them they'll go for that more. Yeah, quite aggressive yeah cheers mark thanks mate and I've also been looking at some of these uh, prawn imitations as well. Uh, a real big variety. I'll leave a list for you. But um, we've got the Z-Man prawns as well. These ones here. Uh, another type of creature bait. So you don't just have to use soft plastics in the normal way of shads and sand eel imitations. You see here that the weight is in the belly of this prawn. This is a Z-Man one, I think. Same here. Um, 
cheapy as uh, cheaper sort of amazon timu ones as well if you want to have an experiment um, and you know some of the craw type baits as well that you can get from fresh water can be utilized i will actually cut into the plastic just to make that sure that hook uh, moves freely in and out but if you're over sandy ground or free lining it then i would definitely uh, not fish that weedless just have that hook poking out same with this uh, prawn lure as well just a little cut nice little razor blade cut here so the hook can move again i mean this is all a big experiment no lure fishing now but bombarda rigs uh, for some of those drifting them out using these floats these uh, just need a couple of beads and some uh, float stops and some of these sink some of these float basically just keeps means you can get a bit more distance on these lighter lures a couple of my favorite prawn imitations out of the box are the voodoo ones and this live target one as well uh, to me that looks like really does look like a prawn big brood of prawn um, and along with the voodoo i think they might be my favorites but as i say this is all experimentation um, I had a decent fish last year on a prawn lure, which is, in my mind, a creature bait. And uh, I want to try and replicate that again this year. So so another option is this one here. It's not your normal sort of shad or paddle tail. You're just dragging this weighted lure across the bottom, bouncing it off rocks. Uh, it's got a weedless attachment there. But yeah, just something else to try. So thinking about it then, is really a case of trying to adapt uh, and be influenced by some of this fresh water lure fishing that we see in America. They're a little bit ahead of us in terms of techniques, the types of lures uh, and what they're doing. And we've had a really good example today um, from the chap showing us um, what we could perhaps be using in the UK water. And it really is a time for experimentation. Um, I hope you go out there and give this sort of fishing a go. Um, and put your own sort of spin on it as well. Looking here at a, a cheaper prawn uh, from Amazon and um, think about adding uh, rattles as well, particularly for prawns because it's the clicking sound that a prawn makes that's attractive to the bass, whereas something like a shrimp won't click, a prawn does. It's got like a Ned rig there, you can see the weight. It's got an offset eye and the weight's like in that sort of um, saucer shape. I'm always looking out for having a good hook. But once you put that on there, you can see that where the weight is, just leaves that bit to be a bit flexible. So that's one way of hooking them. Um, these Z-Man ones have got uh, like a thin weight in there along the shank of the hook. And these ones here, you can see they're going to have a treble plus an assist hook at the end, like a little single, an inline single 2-0 or 3-0, whatever that is. So, what I'd like to do is just have a play around with different ways of hooking them, um, just to see what ups the catch rate. Um, don't really want to fish these weedless uh, for better hookups, but you just want to drift it. So, you know, you can have an experiment, a little bit of free movement on the prawn, why not? get wacky style like that. Oh. After I've finished the session, wash down the gear, I do like to update my fishing catch report book. It's a great way to look back at previous years and you do start to see patterns. For example, I never seem to do well in northeasterlies like we've had a lot of recently. You can now borrow your own version to fill in on Amazon. I'll leave the link underneath. Uh, it is a really handy way of recording your sea fishing catches. With surface colours is very different to what fish would see underwater as the water gets deeper. Um, but the water absorbs different colours of light in varying amounts. And the colour that's absorbed the most is red. So when you look at this lure coming down, as that drops lower and lower, you see less and less red. Uh, but it looks dull or even black because the red light is absorbed once it reaches the fish's eyes. As we go from red to shorter wavelengths like the orange, yellow, green, blue and violet, each colour is absorbed less. Blue is absorbed the least, so it travels the furthest under water. The clarity of the water also matters 
Uh, clear water allows light to travel further so we can see colours better. Now take a look at these three lures here in front of us. Three slightly different blues or are they? So those three lures are actually exactly the same colour believe it or not and all I'm doing there is changing the background and it makes it look like the lures themselves are changing colour. Lots of blue colours you'll notice. Um, we get mackerel here. I think these represent the mackerel quite well. Um, surface lures, those pachinkos. And again, I do sort of prefer more natural colours and also a smaller lure as well. Never really done well on those bigger surface lures. I'm sure a smaller lure gives you a better chance. Covering, and I keep showing this uh, bit of footage here because I think it's really important when it comes to colour and lure type. Matching the hatch. So that's the lure we caught it on. That's a little whiting I think. I think that's a whiting that's come out of the bass's mouth. So you can see why the bass has wanted that lure if that's what it's feeding on. That'll have been on the same tide that. Wow. You can see then. We had two years in a row after Covid where all the bass really wanted in September and October were whiting type lures. You see here it's just fish after fish um, and all they really wanted were white lures and that was because I think they were after the whiting um, and this one spat something very similar out that looks like the lure so try and match the hatch whenever you can. Um, and I mean another thing with colour as well we had a I seem to get a load of fish on pink lures it was the it was the only color over a few sessions last few years uh, that caught was pink um, so there'll always be something pink in there why that is i don't know <laughs> um, but sometimes it's all they'll touch which is a good reason to keep changing your lures until you find what they want but why not get a variety of colors to try this is from bass lures uk and they can provide all those colors um, at a good budget I was speaking to the owner of Drift Lures as well uh, and interestingly they sell lures up and down the country and they find that different colours are popular in different locations and that, that can't always just be superstition. I mean, for example, they sell more of the lemon colour uh, down near Brighton off the jetties and piers there whereas in Hastings I know that white seems to be more favourable particularly in recent years. But ultimately you can't buy every colour. I would perhaps start off with um, some natural colours. So your greens and browns. And then definitely have some white lures in soft plastics. And then maybe those pink and orange ones too. Uh, and that's it. No, that's not it, is it? <laughs> I forgot. Uh, blues, mackerel colours. Those shiny mackerel in the summer. Um, a whole host of ways of representing mackerel with greens and blues. But um, I keep saying the J13, there's also the J11. These are really old fashioned by today's standards. Clunky casting, won't cast anywhere as near as some of these modern Japanese lures. Uh, I do like them in natural colours. You can see here we've got blue. Uh, so if you're going past an obstruction, dig down into the lure, fast retrieve, bit of tip action, and it'll bring the lure down deep and then if you're coming up to a, like a shallow reef just let go the lure floats to the surface well we are in again <laughs> nice little pull on this one again they're not big bass but they not give a great fight <sighs> there's been a lot of talk on the channel about bass fishing at night uh, it's not something i'm very experienced with but when i do i always seem to do so well um, this cotton candy flash boost by Shimano um, was an absolute killer. Um, lots and lots of small fish uh, I've had last year at night. So yes, the bass can see the lures. Um, I prefer those sort of lighter colour lures. And as I say, for some reason, that flash boost did really well. There we are. And that performed the soft plastics as well. Bear in mind what the bait fish are doing at night, it's worth remembering they're not 
yeah. zooming around everywhere, are they? They're almost Another asleep. One. So one if you are fishing at night, Beautiful. consider uh, retrieving a little bit slower. Uh, but other than that, as I say, not very experienced, but um, I would definitely say give it a go. Uh, had a lot of bass, 50, 60 bass, uh, with about 15 keepers just by fishing at night and um, we only had a few sessions for that as well so plenty of videos of our night fishing forays on the channel So you'd use clear fluorocarbon for this. First thing is to just do an overhand knot in the line like that, leaving a couple of inches on the running end and then put that through the eye of the lure. No need for a lure clip on this one. Then you take that running end and then you just put it through the loop you've just made. Shouldn't be any twists in it at this point. And then take that running end up the line four turns. back through the loop you've just tied. Oh. So although that's when you're tying directly to the lure, particularly a soft plastic, if you're using a lure clip, you don't use that knot, or at least I don't. Um, I use, a, I suppose it's a double uni knot, it might be called, I'm not sure what it's called. Uh, so you've got the breakaway lure clip, which is my favorite brand of lure clip. Uh, we're just gonna use this bigger, black line just so I can show you obviously you want to fish as light as possible as light as you dare um, but I just if I'm attaching it to the lure clip uh, then I go through the lure clip once obviously the advantage of a lure clip is you get to change lures a bit quicker encourages you to do so as well and you go back round on yourself and just do five turns Uh, keep everything nice and tight. See thumb and forefinger holding the loop. Five turns like that. And then I go make another loop and just hold everything nice and tight in there. And then give five turns back the way I've come. Uh, it just keeps the loops nice and tight. Uh, when you go back on yourself so you do lose uh, lose the first ones you tied and then obviously we're going to be using fluorocarbon for this but just that will <laughs> so i'm only using this just a demonstration but that will pull right back um on there uh, some people do an extra turn and super glue but i find that works over the years anyway There's no doubt that single hooks are better for fish welfare and certainly easier to unhook them. Um, you notice that in a lot of my videos I've got treble hooks. Now treble hooks are more effective, uh, has to be said. I have missed a lot of fish using single hooks. Now a lot of that might be down to me, uh, my skill as an angler. Uh, but I do see a significant decline in hookup rates with single hooks. That is not to discourage you uh, to using them. I'll be using them a lot more this season. I've got some nice uh, 2.0 inline single hooks from Cox and Roll. I've been replacing the original rusty treble hooks on my lures with some inline singles. You take the gape of the single hook and it should be the same as two of the treble hooks, same width. And then normally I make sure it doesn't get caught over the top. These are pretty good. At the most hard lures I use a 2.0 you do find uh, occasionally it will be the trailing treble that might damage the bass. Um, I've had it happen a couple of times but it certainly is maybe 1 in 50 fish. Set those hooks. I've actually got trebles. I've just missed the fish, just missed the fish on the singles. 
so you will see I mean this one here beautifully hooked with a single and it is a case of easily unhooking it um, but then by the same account you know we've had this fish here this is a treble hook uh, and that can easily come out as well so yeah maybe consider crunching the barbs cutting off one of the three trebles perhaps always um, be mindful of how that affects the weight of the lure as well so yeah um, <laughs> I'm not a hundred percent advocate either way uh, it's still a bit of a work in progress but do consider using single hooks particularly for fish welfare so I'll be honest I'm not really into the technical side of the lure fishing rods people always ask what rod do I use um, but I can offer some uh, sort of starting point for me I prefer an eight and a half or an eight foot rod and a lot of that is due to the places I fish I'll be casting and moving casting and moving uh, along the open coast I will have cliffs up behind me so um, I favor a slightly shorter rod than most but you know for things like estuaries um, you might want a nine nine and a half foot rod and there's even even some of my friends are trialing now 11 foot lure rods from Japan so um, a good starting point would probably be nine foot but uh, something just over eight foot for me is best uh, in terms of brands you know I'd love to spend money on a brand new sort of top of the range Shimano but there's some good there's a good choice now entry level lure rods uh, from Penn Drift we've got one of these drift uh, rods with us today uh, for a little over a hundred pounds you know you can get a really decent rod that will last you a few seasons people often ask why are the rod uh, rings so small on these but a lot of it is to do with finesse um, you can get a braided line with a nicely tied FG knot uh, to run through the rings uh, and it just really helps keep that line close to the blank and keeps the weight down as well so no big uh, rings on these especially the eye nice to keep it nice and neat and then you've got a lot more control over that lure people often talk about a fast action or a fast tip action um, basically a, a, a tip that uh, corrects itself nice and quickly but bends a lot I suppose that I don't know is that the best way of describing it um, a faster action will help you flick out those soft plastics the lighter soft plastics and rods as we know rated to, for a particular gram and that's like an ideal casting weight so I've not really got any affiliation with any brands but I have to say um, these favorite rods are brilliant uh, right across the range um, you seem to get as much value as possible and uh, at the big one event that we saw some footage of at the start of this video uh, they had a stand there with some incredible rods for the money really good across the range um, so yeah if I had say 200 pounds to spend I'd be looking at some of the favorite rods so that is you know that is just my opinion and I don't get to fish with a huge range of rods but um, I'll be sticking with uh, favourite brands and that Drift DRX lure rod that we saw. Uh, when it comes to reels though, <laughs> I think I've nailed this down now. Uh, really simple for me, a 2500 size or a 3000 Shimano reel uh, according to your budget. Just stick with Shimano, they're a fantastic brand, they've been doing this for years. Um, and then whatever you want to spend on a reel, stick with Shimano. Uh, for me, I'm using an Altegra. Um, you get a lot of value for your money uh, and they, they're they really reliable reels. So yeah, simple one that for me. They're, they're a bit lighter than the pen ones. I'm sure everyone's got their favorites, um, but I'm gonna stick with the Shimano brand personally. What on earth is that? That's uh, one of the questions that often gets asked. I think I have stuff in my tackle box that uh, I don't fully explain what it is um, and this one's cropped up a couple of times. This is a, the Sheikah 130 I think. It's a Lumi Predator hybrid lure so it's got a soft plastic uh, that twists on and off and then on the front end there you've got a bit of a hard plastic so a um, bit of both worlds there with a weedless hook. Just something that I want to give a go at this year. See too, you don't see too many people using sinking lures and sometimes that can be the difference 
between catching and not with the bigger fish lower down. Now this is a Savage Gear Seeker, um, always worth having a metal in your lure fishing box because if you want to cast bigger distances, fish are feeding offshore a bit or you want to fish a bit deeper. And actually I want to try and do some almost vertical jigging off piers with this. I've had fish um, using that method, so not really retrieving it, just sort of bouncing it up and down, letting it flutter down. Oh, there's so much to do with this lure fishing. <laughs> I've got a lot to do this summer. Bucktails as well, so feathers with a weighted head. I've been using those off the kayak, but um, someone asked what they were the other day. And that's them, the bucktails. Again, something else to try. Can you catch bass in unclear water, so when it's muddy and murky? Yes, you can. <laughs> I need to learn this more, really, because I've had friends that have caught in really terrible conditions that I would not even think of lure fishing in. Um, so if I can offer some advice and that is not to do as I do which is almost exclusively fish with clearer water and uh, it's something I've got to stop doing really there is some evidence to suggest that uh, bigger bass are more likely to take a lure they're less less finicky uh, when the conditions are like that a big old wise bass um, in clear water will probably know that that's a lure but put it in some dirtier water its lateral line will pick up the vibrations of a lure even soft plastics you know it's enough that they'll pick up on those vibrations and um, hone in on the lure and smash it with confidence um, but I haven't done that I've, I've always been someone that favors the clear waters and you will pick up fish but maybe smaller fish so perhaps that's something I need to change going into 2024 try and fish that dirtier water in terms of you know general good water conditions aerated water is really key um, on this Sussex coastline that I fish um, you really are looking for that oxygenated water whether it's wave action that's doing it bigger tides and I find that the fish really feed well and confidently in aerated water sometimes you can have conditions it's a lovely beautiful day and it's nice and calm uh, but the fish are just not there when it's like that so don't worry about fishing a little bit of rougher conditions. Keeping yourself safe, of course, at all times. But Often ask as well, what's my best lure? Or if you could only have one lure, what would I choose? Um, obviously, <laughs> it depends, doesn't it? Where you're fishing and you know, what the bass are actually up to. But I have got an answer for you. I'll come on to that in a minute. But it is worth understanding that you know say my Sussex patch of coastline we don't do too well on sand eel type lures because we don't really have the sand eels here in the numbers that they do down in the southwest so um, it's not going to be a sand eel lure um, I've had good catches with the mega bass zonk over the years as viewers will know but statistically uh, you notice that we've got these uh, catch diaries I've been looking back on the last two years and the outstanding lure for me has been the Shimano Flash Boost in that cotton candy. So anyway, plenty of tips here. If I could add one more, it might just be use a sinking hard lure this year. You might be surprised that it does pick up the bigger fish, uh, but, you will, but you may get it snagged a bit more.